Hello and welcome to The Leading Question. I'm your host, Steve Wigreiser. Today's question is, what is the future of specialty practices in medicine, not only here in Philadelphia, but regionally in the Delaware Valley and throughout the state and nationally? I can't think of a better person to answer that question than our guest today, Dr. Alex Vaccaro. Uh, Dr. Vaccaro's credentials are incredible. He is an internationally acclaimed spine surgeon. He is president of the Rothman Orthopedic Institute here in Philadelphia and now in New Jersey, New York, and Florida. He is chairman of the orthopedic department at Jefferson. He has written more than a thousand peer-reviewed articles he lectures internationally. I'm very excited to have you on this show today. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Dad. So, <laughs> I appreciate the introduction. There you go. Um, so, how about a quick response to the leading question today? What do you think the future is of specialty practices in the field of medicine? Okay, as a specialist and as a super specialist, a spine surgeon, specialty care will remain the same, but we're gonna see a different trend that you didn't expect me to say. We're gonna see primary care get bigger. We all need primary care physicians. How Absolutely. many times do you and I have a problem and we try to call a primary care physician and we, we don't have an opportunity? Oh, it's three months, four months. Oh, you have to get concierge care to get in the front door. Society needs to have a good primary care physician. And I call them a quarterback because they're the, pa they're the physician that has to look at the patient as a whole and has to sort of manage the patient holistically and then decide, okay, I, it's beyond my expertise. I'm going to go get an orthopedic surgeon. I'm going to get a cardiologist. I'm going to get a GI doc. So specialty care will remain, will become more specialized, will become more trained in, in new technologies that you and I can't even imagine. But primary care is here to stay and only to get stronger. And it has to get stronger for us to bend the cost curve to afford care in the future. Well, I got to tell you, um, I'm a user like, like most of our viewers of primary care medicine. I have a, what I call a family doctor, a general practitioner. I really don't have a problem. Now, I use uh, the family practitioners at Jefferson, and I don't have a problem with it. But the complaint that I get the most, uh, and you know what I do on a daily basis, um, I, I get, well, I call and then I get a nurse practitioner or I get a physician assistant. I can never see a medical doctor. What do you think about that? So look at it as convenience of care. The best scenario is that you should be able to see a care provider within 24 hours. There's only so many physicians out there. And the advanced practice practitioners, and physician assistant, nurse, nurse practitioner, they're trained in certain specialties. So if I have a problem, I want to be seen the next day. If the physician's not available, I don't want to be told to go to the emergency room because you know the quagmire going to an emergency room is you're there for five to six hours. Uh, they tell you, go see a doctor anyway. So I love the fact that we have extenders. My extender, I have a physician assistant and I have a nurse that are phenomenal. I train them every day like I train a resident. They've been with me for two, four, six, eight years, and every day they see 50 patients with me. They can close their eyes and almost do spine surgery. They're phenomenal. So I think we should be happy that we have physician assistants and nurse practitioners. And you can see by the quality, like I don't receive phone calls that say, I saw this nurse practitioner, that person did not know what they were doing. So I'm happy we can sort of give, and I call it concierge care, but not concierge care, but give, giving care where we have service at your fingertips. So I like the concept. You mentioned concierge care, and some of our viewers may not be familiar with that. So isn't that a, a service where you pay a certain amount each year, and that guarantees you access to a general practitioner? Well, we all have access if we have insurance, and that's another problem with this healthcare system in America, but it gives you more convenient and more timely access. So the biggest problem I have is that I'm a strong believer that we should have universal healthcare coverage for basic healthcare needs. All of us should get wellness care, heart, lungs, everyone should have access to it. I don't care what economic group you're in. The problem is we all have access, but we can't, we, we all have insurance, but we don't have the access that we need it. You have to see someone tomorrow. So concierge care 
is for those that can afford, and every geographic area is different, it may cost $1,000, $1,500, $2,000, but when you call, you get a call back within a certain amount of time, and you have access, and that person will then be sort of the gatekeeper and then order all the tests and stuff like that. I don't have a concierge. I'm sort of against the concept uh, of paying my primary care physician. I mean, I, you and I are fortunately, knock on wood, healthy, so I don't have headaches. But if I had a chronic disease uh, and I had to make 15 phone calls, and, and we don't have sort of an integrated network, like the future of healthcare is for you, Steve, to go to one building and all the care providers surround you. That's not the way it is today. That would be great. You go to this building, then you go to that building, then you gotta go to that building, then you gotta wait a week. That's not the way care should be. It's gotta be integrated and the patient should be the center of care and all the providers should be around and then getting together and talking. Concierge care sort of delivers that model now. In the future, we'll have that model, so you may not have concierge care. And then there's people that want care sooner than they need. If you, if you go to the Canadian healthcare system, you get in a queue. If you go to the British healthcare system, you get in a queue and you wait. And maybe it's okay to wait four weeks, five weeks, six weeks. Americans don't like to wait. Yeah, we're not used to waiting. Don't like to wait. So maybe a concierge, you're paying a little extra money. Is it fair? Is it fair to people that don't have the money? I would argue it's not fair for those people. So it's not equitable. Right. So I, I think we have to make health care equitable. And I think the, the, the tiers of insurance you know, work against that. So if I was able to make the rules, which I don't have the ability to make the rules, everyone would have universal access to basic health care needs. And then I could see the insurance business getting in for if you need a hernia, if you need a knee replacement, if you have to get a colonoscopy, then I could see having insurance for that. But for the taxes that you and I pay, we deserve that type of care. I agree with you. I think everybody deserves that type of care, regardless of their income level. You mentioned emergency departments. Not long ago, I thought I had a kidney stone. I went into an emergency department. Uh, after about the five hour mark, they put an IV line in my arm. And then I sat for another two hours, at which point I said, enough of this, I'll deal with it some other way. And I had them take the IV out and I left. Another friend of mine who was involved in another health system asked me how long I think it took in his health system to actually see a physician when you come in through the emergency department. Now, I don't know whether he embellished the number, but it was close to 24 hours. What is going on in our emergency departments? Why are the waits so long? Can you give us any insight to that? Because sure. I know that's something that affects our viewers on a regular basis. There's a concept I use called, and it's a well-known concept, the social determinants of health. We don't have access to care, so then we sort of revert to the local emergency rooms. We have, we have urgent cares, which are great, they decompress, but again, you have to pay for it, you have to have insurance for a lot of these urgent cares. So one of the most equitable places we have in this country is an emergency room. I went in recently, dropped the name, then I'm a spine surgeon, and I waited six hours, just like you did. There's no, Get in the front of line when you go to the emergency room I in America. Your name. <laughs> and, and they made you <laughs> wait another two hours. So you are a plaintiff malpractice attorney, and you waited seven hours, which I love. I love that, by the way. So oh, we, we, yeah, we, we, we don't get to the front of the line. But it's not the problem with the emergency rooms. The emergency rooms are great. Those physicians, they have the highest burnout rate of all the physicians. I was just with the chairman of uh, emergency room at Jefferson. Highest burnout rate. There's violence that comes into inner city emergency rooms. They're not safe places at times. I was there last week taking care of a professional athlete, and I had two professional athletes in one room, and they wheel another patient in who's in a cardiac arrest, and they're trying to save his life, and I said, God bless the nurses, the, the physician extenders, and the physicians that have to work in those places. It's just that we just don't have enough access. So it's, it's a symptom of society, one of the social determinants of health. We're in Philadelphia. You know, and there's a lot of people, and a lot of people need help. So we need to somehow shore up our medical resources without increasing the cost of care and putting more burden on the average payer, but have easier access. And the way we do that is we open up urgent cares, like, Orth like Rothman opened up urgent care centers, and they become busy. I mean, imagine if you fall down, you have a bump in your wrist, did I break my wrist? And you wanna to go to the emergency room? You and I don't wanna to go to the emergency room. So you go to an urgent care, you get an x-ray, you have a physician assistant say, I think you have a fracture, let me, through telemedicine, let me communicate with the hand surgeon, oh, it's okay to put a splint on, and you're out in 20, 30 minutes. We have to make it affordable. So, so the, the number of available emergency departments dropped. We, we lost Hahnemann, for example, which was a big provider of emergency medicine. But in response, 
alternatives have grown, like the urgent care system, and you're endorsing that system. Oh, I love it. Urgent care is great. Uh, and again, they're popping up all over the place. But again, you have to have the right insurance to get into these places. Now, I'm not familiar with the insurance needs, but I know at the Rothman Institute, we have our criteria. It's that the nice thing about a community emergency room is anyone can go there with no means at all. It is the perfect place to make us all equal. Uh, but we have to respect the fact that the system is overtaxed and everyone's working on it. You can't point a finger at anybody. It's just our society today. It's not the government's fault. It's not the city planner's fault. It's not the physician's fault. It's just they're overtaxed. Like you said, Hahnemann was a massive emergency room. And most of those patients now go to Jefferson. Right. They go to Jefferson now. And right. I, just, I just remember when that happened and how crowded the emergency rooms become. And you just have to, I tell every physician, walk through the emergency room one day. You have an unbelievable respect for the providers in the emergency room. And I, as I said the other week when I was there, I just sat down and I took you know, my hats off to those care providers. Oh yeah, and, and I've always said, and I think we've discussed this, uh, emergency department physicians have to be brilliant diagnosticians. They don't have the time that most physicians do. They gotta, they gotta erect a differential diagnosis. They gotta come to some conclusion. They have to rule out the most harmful of possibilities all within a very, very short period of time. So my hat's off to them certainly as well. Um, it sounds like if we expand the primary care system, in whatever way we will do that in the future to accommodate more people, we can take some of the pressure off the emergency departments. 100%. All right, let's, let's go way back now. I wanna know where you grew up and tell us something about your childhood. I was born in White Plains, New York. I spent some time in Scarsdale. Both my parents grew up in Scarsdale, New York. My dad worked for IBM for over 30 years. My mother became a nun. Let's stop the show right now. Right, okay. yeah. And then she decided to leave the convent and then got married and then had five kids nine months apart. And then there was a delay of four or five years for the sixth child. And then we moved to Bergen County, New Jersey. And I left when I was 17 to go to college in Boston and then to Georgetown Medical School. And then, and then you're in the educational you know, system until you're 31 to be a specialist. Right. And then I, I made no money. I was 31. I remember I got married. My bank account had about $6,000 in it. I got married and I, w I lived in Fifth and Spruce and I ran into you a year later. I probably did, I think I ran into you a year I later. Think, I think we did. One of the nicest guys I've ever met <laughs> in the world. I'm just talking about Philadelphia, in the world. Well, I appreciate that. You didn't tell us though where you fit in one of six. Um, the second child, so, and believe it or not, it goes girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy. This is your resume. Now, I know you think it's a tremendous waste of paper, waste but I, I wanted to show our viewers this is hundreds of pages, and we're not, certainly not going to go through it. But I think you begin to get clues as to how you wind up with something like this, as impressive as this is, if you talk about some of your early influences. The number one two people that I respect the most were my parents. My father worked nonstop, he would be in the den, I don't know if you call it the family room, the den, and he would just be working nonstop. So I got my worth ethic from my mom and dad, and then all the people I was surrounded with, my coaches, I played sports. Like, I'm a big advocate of participating in sports because the coaches invest in you, they mentor you, they teach you to be the best you can be, and I remember them. I remember my team physician when I was in Pee Wee football, Dr. Ferraro. And I said, I'm gonna be a doctor. When I was eight years old, I said, I'm gonna be a doctor. And my mother said, good for you. And I just did that. And then people say, well, why do you spend so much time writing research papers and the research? I said, because I developed a sleep disorder, becoming a resident. And the, it's different now, but now we have an 80 hour work week limit. But when I went through training, you were on call every other night. You just stayed up all night and worked, and you went to work the next day, and then you stayed up all night and you went to work. And what happens is, unfortunately, you get used to sleeping three to four hours a night. You don't want to. Right. And then, then you have, it's like Pavlov dog response. You hear a beep and you're like, you hear any type of beep and you, you jump up. You don't, as a trauma surgeon, you don't want to hear a helicopter, because every time you hear a helicopter, someone's being helicoptered in, and you don't want to hear a beep anymore. Now we have cell phones, which is great. But think about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that the beeper. beep. Yeah. So what happened was, I just, I wake up early in the morning, and, and I just, and then I, instead of just sitting around moping, I'm waking up, I, I do research and I write papers. So at some point, you uh, chose medicine, and I have to think there was more to it than Dr. Ferraro. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I am. Um, I had a strong love for sciences, strong love for biology. Uh, I remember dissecting the worm, dissecting the frog. Remember that seventh, eighth grade. I remember liking nature, and I and I started to get into it. And then, of course, the the physicians. I, and I, I, I'm being straightforward. It was my team physicians that mentored me because I'd see these guys work all day long and then they'd come at night into the locker room with us and hang out and just they just took an interest and they didn't get paid anything I mean they, this was they were just volunteering and uh, and they were great coaches th themselves so I just fell in love with it and then you, you know you go to college and you're pre-med you get you got a thousand kids pre-med at a big university and then they're like at the end of the day the only 50 of you are going to get in I mean it was it was crazy back then but let me ask you this are you are you one of these guys that is so smart that you didn't have to work, or did you work really, really hard in order to achieve? When you watch a surgeon who does the same thing over and over again, they look like it's so easy, like Michael Jordan playing basketball, because he's done it a million times. So surgery is doing the same thing over and over and over again. That's all it is, so everything we do, what you do as an attorney, what I do as a physician, it's just constant, repetitive. I mean, there's people out there that are just intuitively bright. You, like, you talk to someone, you're like, that guy's They're brilliant. You know, brilliant. That's not what physicians are. Physicians are hardworking people who are dedicated to make people's quality of lives much better. That's all we are. So it's, none of us are geniuses, we just work hard. Well, you are a great and brilliant spine surgeon. How long into your career did it take for you to become that surgeon? When I was in my first year of practice, coming out of my chief residence, I was married and I said, I got married my first year out, and I said to my wife, I go, I think I'm a pretty good spine surgeon. And then a year later, I go, no, 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 I wasn't very good, but now I think I'm really good. And every two to four years, I would turn to my wife and go, oh, remember I told you I thought I was good? You constantly get better, and there's been studies that have shown the longer a, a surgeon is in practice, his complication rate goes down and his mortality rate goes down because you've seen everything. You can anticipate an adverse event before it happens. You can anticipate an adverse event just meeting the patient in the office. As long as you stay focused, you get better and better as more time goes by. The question you and I have is now, when does a surgeon say, it's time to stop operating? You got pilots up there. You've got people who are driving trucks, you got surgeons holding scalpels. At what point do we say enough is enough? I think you always have to think about your future. Like today is good, right. what will tomorrow bring? And where do you need to go in the future? Are you doing what you need to do for society? Like everyone wants to contribute to society. Everyone wants to, to say, I did good to help somebody. And in medicine, which is great, Every office hours, you always have a patient that says, thank you very much, you changed my life. That's what we want to do. So the question is, when do we transition out of the physical act of being a technician, maybe be a consultant, and maybe just be an educator? Who knows? Well, I think part of the answer, certainly for me, and I'm sure to a certain extent uh, for you, is knowing that there are people who you have trained who are ready to step in at the highest level and I think that that is a great segue to your model at the Rothman Institute so let's talk a little bit about that um, tell us about Rothman why Rothman why'd you get started with Rothman and where are you today I didn't know where it was going to be I was doing my residency with Dick Rothman he was my chairman uh, I chose to go to Thomas Jefferson for a crazy reason I was at Georgetown Medical School and like any senior I wanted to basically have fun and we have something called Match Day in March. But one residency program didn't do Match Day in March. One did it in October, five months earlier. And I said, ooh, I'd love to get into that program and then get my job and then have the rest of the year. And I, I joined the Peace Corps that year. I went, I went there was a, the war between the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese, and I went over to Indochina to, uh, to work. And I, I, I took this residency at Jefferson. Didn't know much about Dick Rothman. And then I got there, and of course he was a luminary in orthopedics, yep. and it was just a phenomenal residency program. And in my second year, he offered me a job. Now, I'm not from Philadelphia. I'm from the New York area. And right. he offered me a job, and I'm like, I wasn't too excited about it. I was like, sure, 
<laughs> what kind of mistake did I make now? I'm like, and then I remember telling my family, everyone's up in Bergen County, New Jersey, in New York, and they're like, what are, you, what, are you, what are you doing? You're a Jets fan. You're a Giants fan. You're a Mets, Yankees. Are you out of your mind? And I go, yeah, it was probably a mistake. So I, the next three years I trained, I came back, and then joined the Rothman Institute, and it's been the greatest thing I've ever done. It's the largest single specialty orthopedic practice in the world right now. We have 236 doctors now. They're not all orthopedic surgeons. We have some physiatrists for pain management. Uh, and that's basically it. Physiatrists, we have non-operative sports medicine. And then we have orthopedic surgeons. And as you said, again, the business models are constantly changing. We're sort of forging new business models. And we succeed and we fail. And we succeed and we fail. And then, and then on top of that, we have things called COVID and the pandemic, right. cost of capital, inflation, staffing problems. So it has been a lesson in business as well as a lesson in what is the best, best healthcare model in the future for musculoskeletal care, providing orthopedic care. If we can go back to the decision to uh, join uh, Dick Rothman and ultimately the Rothman Institute. My recollection is that he was known primarily for joint replacement. So believe it or not, Dick Rothman was originally, can I have a drum roll please? A spine surgeon. I didn't know that. He was a spine surgeon, one of the top spine surgeons and probably one of the top textbooks in its ninth edition, I could have that number wrong, is Rothman and Simeon right. textbook of spine surgery. He stopped, his last surgery was in 19. 88, I believe, is a spine surgery. He just said, I can't make people with spinal ailments do as well as I could with a total joint arthroplasty. Because you know, if you're a 65-year-old gentleman with a bad knee or hip and you have a joint replacement, you feel great. You can't say that with spine. Yeah. You may make the leg pain feel better, but you can't make the back pain feel better. So he got out of it. And at that time, we had um, two great spine surgeons that I worked with, Richard Balderson and Jerry Collar. And they were my mentors. And then I did my fellowship with Steve Garford in California. We're a family. When you're a surgeon and you work with a bunch of other guys, I think right now we have 14 spine surgeons now. Back then we had four. We go through the ups and downs of any type of business in medicine today. And business is under a lot of pressure in medicine. I mean, it's, it's expensive to run a practice. And as you and I know, the government is not reimbursing more. We're getting paid equal to what we got paid in 1991. Inflation, the CPI has gone up, but what they pay physicians has not gone up. So there's a lot of stress there. Not everyone gets to have Alex Vaccaro as their spine surgeon. And earlier I alluded to the fact that one of the considerations in knowing when to retire or to slow down is knowing that there are surgeons, or in my case lawyers, who are up to the task of well representing or uh, operating in a quality way upon patients. Uh, you say there are 14 other spine surgeons at the Rothman. Uh, do you think when you ultimately uh, say, you know what, I'm going to slow down, and by the way, there's absolutely no sign of that now, um, will there be a drop-off in quality and care? No, no, no. The guys that we have at the Rothman Institute are the best in class. Most of them we've trained, believe it or not. So when you, we have four spine fellows a year, and these are people who graduate from the top programs in the country. This year we have, and I don't want to leave anyone out, we have two people from Harvard, we have one person from Davis, and we have one person from Mount Sinai. So those are our four fellows. And they're phenomenal. And then every two or three years, we pick one of them and say, you're the best I've ever seen in the last five years. We want to hire you. So those are the spine surgeons of the Rothman Institute. They're all capable. I would let any of my partners operate on me. One of the things that fascinates me uh, the most uh, about the Rothman Institute is your insistence upon a commitment to academic medicine, publications, and academic credentials. People choose what they want to do in life, and we're into teaching, research, different educational things. So we we get a group, a bunch of um, like-minded people who have been committed to doing research to find out how we can improve musculoskeletal care. So uh, that's one of the criteria we use to decide if you become a partner. The other thing is we sort of incentivize. How do you get someone to do something you want them, you want them to do? You basically give them something to incentivize. So we actually give money, and part of the payment is predicated on are you committed to teaching? 
or you're committed to research and you manifest and and the and the way we, we show that is publishing papers peer review which means you you come up with original research you develop a hypothesis you perform the, the study and it takes it could take a year to get a study done and then you send it out to journals and get it peer reviewed and, and hopefully published and the, and you do that because you want to move the needle you want to make a patient's life better because you've developed a better implant you've come up with a better physical therapy protocol you've come up with a, a better way of doing something and that's who we want to train at the Rothman Institute that doesn't mean that everyone has to do that because there's some great clinicians that say listen I don't want to do that I want to teach residents I want to teach medical fine and then you have others that just want to be great community orthopedic surgeons and because they provide a great service we say sure so we have a, we have a model for everybody but we do incentivize those that finish working that want to wake up at 3 30 in the morning like that, that want to write a paper <laughs> we do incentivize that it, but it doesn't mean you're bad if you don't do that but we love people. So I have a bias. So in spine surgery, yeah. you pretty much have to be committed to research to get hired. You've traveled throughout the world. You are familiar with the health systems of numerous other countries. Uh, you mentioned Canada and Britain. I know you've been to many, many other countries. Um, I want to know your take on the biggest problems we're facing here and if you can do a little comparative analysis to healthcare systems in other countries, I would appreciate it. And if that wasn't enough for one question, I'd like to get some insight into the future of medicine from the perspective of Dr. Alex Vaccaro. I've been all over the world. The benefit is, and I, I, yesterday I, I flew to Los Angeles for a day and spoke at Cedar sinai You meet people, you see how they do things, you see how they're, they run their system. Um, and when you go to different countries. And so I just want to say that what you think the other healthcare systems are, it's really not that way. If you think, oh, universal healthcare is great in Great Britain, it's really not. If you go to Canada, I think it's fantastic, it's not. Uh, and if you go to America, it's not the greatest system. So the, the perfect system, if you put it all together, and I always say, I spend time designing implants in orthopedics. And people say, well, how do you design an implant? I said, well, I look at the best in class and all the different attributes and I sort of borrow, and then I enhance it another 15% to move the needle. Healthcare systems are the same way. It, it's not that complicated. The problem is we have a lot of people with special interests that don't want change to occur. We have the government, we have the insurance companies, we have all these people fighting, we have the hospitals, we have private equity, they're all fighting. So what should the perfect system be? It should be a little bit of Canada, where everyone is treated equally. You go to Great Britain, you have two different healthcare systems. You have the public and you have the private. You have that in France, you have that in Germany, you have that in Italy, you have that in, in Russia. I've been to all those countries. You have that. Canada's the cleanest when it comes to a single healthcare system. But the problem is, I have a lot of Canadian patients. You know why? Because those that have the means come to America. So it's not the perfect system. Not, so it, it's got to be equitable. So we have a pretty good equitable system here. So what we have to do is we, we have to focus on two things. We have to make the cost of education go away. You should not pay for medical school. Because what happens when you have a $400,000 debt? You make bad decisions. You make bad economic. I need to be a specialist so I can pay back my $400,000 debt. That's the first thing that has to go away. Number two, we have to work on medical legal reform because you and I are on the same page. Patients who get injured should be compensated, but we should get out all the noise of all the other expenses, things that don't make any sense. We have to decrease that cost. And then we have to train surgeons to take care of societies. We have to tra train doctors to take care of society. We need to increase our general practitioners, our family medicine, our internal medicine. We have to get people to love to go into those fields because that's what you and I want. And then we should figure out in a population of patients, how many specialists do we truly need? When you're coming out of med school with a debt of $500,000, you may become a specialist that society doesn't need. So we don't need that at all. So that's a perfect system. So where's healthcare going to go? We're going to battle it out in Congress until people wake up. You have to design in a room the perfect system, and then you have to start the battle in the war. It's like when Obama came up with Obamacare in 2008. He, he chose his enemies and he chose and he, he sided with the American Hospital Association. He, he sided with the attorneys. He didn't really side with the physicians. He allowed everyone to have the possibility of insurance, but people didn't have access because they didn't pay enough for the care. So we'll get there, but we need strong willed physicians to join Congress, to get into political uh, leadership positions, to fight for the common man.
It sounds like you're optimistic about the future of medicine. Couldn't be more optimistic. There we go. Uh, well, look, thank you very much. I want to get you down to the stadium. All right, go birds. Go eagles. There you go. And to our viewers, stay curious, keep asking questions, and I'll see you next time on The Leading Question.